Christians to the unfaithful. And the United Armies treated us, it may be said, as the Turks might have done. The discontent on one side on the other was strong in the circumstances of Napoleon's marriage, about which I shall speak in his place envenomed the already strained relations between France and Russia, the divergence of interest of these two powers, the moral obligation under which France seemed to consider herself to reestablish the kingdom of Poland, Russia's evident hostility towards such a project, all combined to conduct the Paris and St. Petersburg cabinets through a series of alternating squabblings and patchings up to an irreparable and open rupture. A deputation of Hungarians had presented itself to the emperor at Schönbrunn to beg him to take Hungary under his protection and to back up her efforts to separate herself from Austria. Napoleon had at the time conceived a project of placing the Grand Duke of Würzburg on the imperial throne, but made no fixed determination on the subject. The Hungarian Revolution and the change of the Austrian succession were two enterprises which might have led him further than he wished to go, and he did not allow himself to be drawn on. These reasons and the fact that his absence had already been too greatly prolonged under doubtful circumstances prompted him to sign the Peace of Vienna, which he did with but little confidence in his mind. Napoleon often afterwards blamed himself for his fault in leaving Austria too strong for future safety and for not having taken full advantage of his success at Austerlitz when he might have taken or have annihilated the entire Russian and Austrian armies. He had not forgotten that the Austrians had asked for peace 12 years earlier when the French were at Leuven, that whilst he was in Egypt, Austria had taken up arms again, that she only signed the Treaty of Lunaville after having lost the Battle of Hohenlinden, that she had begun war again as soon as she had seen us seriously engaged in making preparations for the expedition to England, that she had only signed the Peace of Vienna after the Battle of Austerlitz, that Emperor Francis had promised at the interview at Sartusitz not to make war on France again, and that this time Austria had once more hoped to surprise Napoleon taken up with the pursuit of the English army in the remotest parts of Spain, and that it was only after Vienna had been occupied a second time that the Austrian government resigned itself to signing peace. The English on their side, seeing the emperor seriously engaged in Germany, and encouraged by the hope that the consequences of the Battle of Essling would cause him serious embarrassments, attempted an expedition into the island of Valkyrin, not indeed to serve their allies' cause, but with the very English object in view of seizing upon the fleet at Antwerp, and of setting fire to it, and of destroying the dockyards. Napoleon's foresight had assured the defense of this immense dockyard of our navy. At the first report of the invasion of the island of Valkyrin, every class of citizen in the neighboring provinces was aroused, without awaiting orders from the Minister of War, men, horses, carriage. Carriages, provisions, and fodder were offered to the functionaries of state who had no difficulty in making a regular use of the same. The National Guards hurried up. Marshal Bernadotte had been deprived of the command of the Ninth Corps, of which he was the leader in Germany. The Emperor had sent him back to France on the pretense of taking a cure at the waters. As a matter of fact, the Emperor had been seriously displeased with him because of his insubordinate and violent character, his boasting, and the order of the day by which he arrogated to himself the right of attributing the victory of the Battle of Wagram to the Saxons, who were a part of his court. Whilst in his letters, he used to complain about their want of vigor and inactivity. This marshal, well knowing that Napoleon would not have selected him to face the English, greedily seized upon the opportunity to impose and render himself indispensable in spite of the emperor on this occasion. Helped by his friend Fouché, who said that Napoleon must be shown that the territory could be defended and the enemy driven out without his help. Bernadotte succeeded in getting himself sent to Antwerp by the Minister of War. The English expedition had already failed at its object at the time of his arrival, but King Louis of Holland, 
who had undertaken the command of the operations out of zeal, seeing Bernadotte arrive without having received any notice that he was being sent to take over the command-in-chief, returned to Amsterdam in a very dissatisfied state of mind. Bernadotte made a great deal of noise, but as a matter of fact, did nothing more than Marshals Kellerman, Montsey, and Bessieres, who were very little talked about. The zeal of the officers of all branches of the service, the bravery of the troops, and above all the devotion of the National Guard and of the inhabitants, the vigorous measures ordered from Schoenbrunn by the Emperor, and finally the utter incapacity of the English commander caused the total failure of this gigantic enterprise. The English expedition forced to retire pitifully lost about a third of its men and its material. The unlucky issue of this important attempt brought with it the fall of the English ministry. Each minister tried to discharge himself of the responsibility and to shift it to another of his colleagues, a denouement which reminds one of Racine's epigram on the subject of the tragedy of Iphigenia, the authorship of which two writers, Leclerc and Carra, claimed. But as soon as the bread had appeared, neither one nor the other wished to have had anything to do with it. I will allude in connection with this campaign to the solicitude with which the emperor insisted that his regiments should be commanded by brave and well-educated officers. The proposals for advancement were submitted to him by the Minister of War. Napoleon charged one of his aides-de-camp, the one whom he considered best suited for work of this kind, to submit the results of this classification for his signature and weighed each candidate's merits. As he was personally acquainted with each officer, his selections were carried out with discernment. Whilst with the army or when the various corps were passing through Paris, the emperor used to hold frequent reviews which were not mere empty parades. He used to cross-examine officers whom he did not know and would invite them to command and carry out maneuvers under his eyes. The maneuvers, which were not in the usual routine, used sometimes to trouble the officers who had made a special study of their profession. Napoleon obliged the officers with whom he was not altogether satisfied to study these maneuvers, placing them under the supervision of the colonels and generals in command. He missed no opportunity to assure himself that they had profited by this completion of their military education. Often whilst reviewing a court d'armée or even on the field of battle, the emperor would pull up in front of a regiment and calling the officers around him would address each by his name. He would ask them to mention whom amongst them they considered most worthy of promotion or of a decoration and then passed on to the soldiers. Such testimony delivered by the peers bound the various regiments together with bonds of confidence and esteem, and these promotions granted by the soldiers themselves had all the more value in their eyes. In the course of one of these distributions of military rewards, which were like family scenes, an under-officer was designated to the emperor as the bravest and the best. The colonel, whilst agreeing that he possessed all the qualities necessary to make a good officer, added that in rendering him this justice, he regretted that on account of a serious drawback, he was unable to recommend him for promotion. What is it? asked Napoleon quickly. Sire, he can neither read nor write. I appoint him officer, colonel, and you will have him admitted as such. During these reviews, Napoleon used to inform himself of the wants of his soldiers, of the state of their accoutrements and equipments, of the quality of the rations, and finally of the way in which the military regulations were carried out. Each soldier was authorized to leave the ranks and to address himself directly to the emperor presenting arms to submit a demand or to make a complaint. No request was ever neglected, but was immediately answered. If the petitioner was worthy of interest, his request was usually granted. Unless it was of a nature to render an injury necessary, there is perhaps no example that indiscreet or unfounded complaints were ever addressed to the emperor in this way. In the course of one of the reviews which he held at Vienna, Napoleon heard that certain regiments had received defective articles of clothing or of equipment, and that embezzlement had taken place in the supply of provisions and fodder. As information had been laid with him on this subject, he ordered that an inquiry should be held. The report having established that these complaints were well-founded, Napoleon sent the papers to a court-martial, 
before whom the culprits were brought for trial. They were condemned to death. The emperor rejected all pleas for pardon, for he wished to make an example. This act of severity acted as a warning to other delinquents. I remember in this connection that one day the emperor entered his workroom in an excited state. Just imagine, he said to me, that I have just put my hand upon a man who robbed the army in Italy in a disgraceful manner. He had protectors under the directoire who assured him of his impunity. Thanks to God I have found him again, and I mean to make a severe example of him. The said F had been a contractor for provisions during the first campaigns in Italy at the time when General Bonaparte was commanding the army. His conduct had given rise to the most serious complaints, and he had been denounced to the Directoire as guilty of malversations and infidelities in the supply of provisions. This contractor had escaped all prosecution, and since that time, Napoleon had heard nothing more about him. I do not know in what way he was put on the scent of his reappearance. He dictated me an order for his examination and confinement. But be it that this individual found the means of evading the vigilance of the authorities, or that Napoleon recoiled before the scandal of a trial in which people whom he did not want to ruin might be compromised. F once more escaped all punishment. My object is to show that Napoleon really objected to capital sentences, and that his personal inclinations prompted him to clemency a virtue which in this case often resembled arbitrariness. An event of the highest importance which occurred during the Austrian campaign was the forcible removal of the Pope from Rome. Apart from the questions which concerned the discipline of the church, other discussions which were to be brought to exploding point by the clash of temporal and political interests had placed fresh storm clouds between the emperor and the Pope. Since the Holy Fathers returned to Rome, the enemies of France had worked upon Pius's vexation at not having brought back with him from France certain concessions to which he considered his condescension had entitled him. However it might be, Rome had become a hotbed of intrigues against the empire. The influence of our enemies, and notably of England, predominated there. Summoned by Napoleon to close his ports upon the English vessels which were cruising the Adriatic, the Pope had replied with a formal refusal alleging that, as the common father of all the faithful, he could not and should not enter into any league against any one of his children. This answer gave rise to interminable correspondence, which first of all tended towards a reconciliation, then became menacing on the emperor's part, whilst on the part of the pope it remained obstinate, invariably negative, and bearing the imprint of the ideas of the Gregories and Bonifaces, written in a language which was not that of the century. This language irritated the emperor's patients, who saw each of his requests rejected by the pope, from whom he was able to obtain nothing. The discontent of the Roman court against Napoleon blinded this government to the inequality of the struggle and increased in proportion to the impotent resistance which it opposed to this redoubtable adversary. One might have said that the court of Rome wished to carry matters to extremes and to defy the emperor. Napoleon then gave orders that Rome should be occupied without any interference in the affairs of the pontifical government and with the greatest consideration for the Holy Father and his court. This violent measure provoked the irritation of the Pope's counselors to its extreme limits. The papal nuncio immediately recalled to Rome from Paris, received orders to leave without taking congé. Rome raised its temporal and spiritual arms against France. The French general in command in Rome received orders in his turn to seize upon the government without interfering with the Pope in spiritual matters and to take measures for the preserving the tranquility of the country. The state of hostility became bitter. The Pope, having issued the bull of excommunication, which he held in reserve, shut himself up in his palace, round which barricades protected by armed men were placed. The agitation amongst the Roman population increased when lying reports had spread the rumor of the critical position in which, as it was said, the French army found itself placed in consequence of the Battle of Esling. The open opposition of the partisans of the Holy See became 
dangerous for the French occupation of Rome. A collision was to be feared, which might place the person of Pius VII in danger. The pontiff, obstinately persisting in his voluntary captivity, deaf to the demands of the governor general, remained unable to calm the effervescence of the public mind. This functionary accordingly took it upon himself to remove the Pope from Rome. And in the night of July 6th and 7th, the Pope was kidnapped in his palace. Whilst this extreme measure was being carried into the fact, the emperor was on the plains of Vagram. The ever-increasing obstinacy of the Pope in refusing what the emperor asked of him must have made Napoleon foresee that circumstances might arise which would make such an act of violence necessary. Napoleon, however, denied ever having given any order for kidnapping the Pope. He would have wished the Pope not to leave Italy so brusquely, but the Grand Duchess of Tuscany and the Governor General of Piedmont, who had received no instructions in this matter, refused to receive the Holy Father either at Florence or Turin. The Emperor did not wish to disavow the Governor of Rome and could not and did not wish to send the Pope back to the capital. He accordingly gave orders that the Pope should be conducted to Savona. Since he had passed Florence and Turin when this order reached its destination, the Pope, who was lodged in Savona in the Bishop's Palace, was treated with necessary respect and dignity. A general distribution of promotions and rewards took place after the Battle of Vagram on the Emperor's Feast Day, which was celebrated at Vienna in all the Army Corps. The three principalities of Vagram, Essling, and Ecmule were created in favor of the Marshals Bertier, Messina, and Davu. The dignity of Marshal, as we have related, was moreover conferred on Generals MacDonald, Udno and Marmont, and the duchies of Gaeta, Cador, Otranto, Massa, Bassano, and Feltra were given to ministers Godin, Champigny, Fouché, Rainier, Marais, and Clark. At the same time, the emperor issued a decree creating the Order of the Three Golden Fleeces. Napoleon, whilst increasing his means for rewarding his brave soldiers, wished to eclipse the rival orders of the Golden Fleece which existed simultaneously in Spain and Austria, and to resuscitate the order as it had originally been founded by Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy. He hoped by means of this competition with Spanish and Austrian orders to annihilate the latter in course of time. All French subjects would be forbidden to accept the orders of these two powers. The reunion of the conditions necessary for admission into the Order of the Three Fleeces would have given the French Order preeminence over the Order of the Legion of Honor. In spite of the publication of the Decree of Institution considering this creation, nobody was appointed to the new order. Whatever may have been Napoleon's reasons for abandoning his first idea on this subject, the fact remains that he never spoke of it again. Another decree ordered the erection of an obelisk in Cherbourg granite on the Terra Plain of Pont Neuf in Paris, bearing the inscription, Napoleon, to the French people. The principal feats of arms of the two campaigns of Jena and Poland were to be represented in bas reliefs on the pedestal. The emperor made a mistake one day, which might have had consequences untimely rather than dangerous. It was at Schönbrunn. If I remember rightly, after the signing of the peace with Austria, Napoleon had written to the emperor of Russia and to the emperor of Austria at the same time. He wanted, as a pastime, to place their letters in their envelopes, which were ready addressed for the purpose with his own hands. After having sealed up one, he carried it to the Austrian general, who was waiting for the letter addressed to his sovereign. Before sealing up the other, I took the precaution of looking at the envelope and noticed that it was addressed to the Emperor of Austria. The letter addressed to this prince had been placed in the envelope to the Emperor of Russia. A messenger was immediately sent off at full speed after the Austrian officer who was carrying off the letter intended for the czar. This quid pro quo might, had it been repeated, have incurred 
under circumstances which might have had evil consequences. The emperor saw this and became so circumspect that whenever he was tempted to close up some letter on which he put his beautiful seals with his own hands, he used to throw it away, saying that he had been near placing me under some heavy responsibility. <laughs>